for desiring to be with us. God, your presence, Lord, it's all that we need. Lord, let it be all that we desire. We love you. We praise you. In your holy and precious name, amen. We are going to continue on in worship through giving. Um, so a slide is going to come up with different ways that you are able to give here at City Beautiful Church um, so that we can partner with our community, um, bless those around us, bless our, our staff. I just invite you to pray and give how the Lord would lead.
Hey City Beautiful family, I'm Nicole and today I'm going to be walking you through a few things that are happening here at City Beautiful Church over the next few weeks. So everything I'm going to mention is also online at citybeautiful.ch slash weekly if um, you need to go back and look at anything. So next week is Vision Sunday. Each year we ask the Lord to give us um, a new vision to guide us through the year. And Ryan and we as leadership, we seek the face of God and we come together and bring together words and ideas for the Lord. And that is something we're going to be sharing next week. We're really excited about it. It's going to be good. So make sure to tune in because that vision is something that we will take throughout this whole year as a church to kind of guide us. And something that kind of goes along with vision, which I'm personally really, really excited about, is write the vision board night. This is on Wednesday, January 27th at the church at 7 p.m. It's an event that I'm really excited to put on just for the ladies of the church. And prayerfully, we're gonna come together. We're gonna set aside some time as the women of this church and women of God who want his influence in our life in 2021 and we're going to worship and partner with God and ask him for personal vision for 2021 and we're going to visualize that and create vision boards together. So last year I created for the first time a vision board like that and even though 2020 was 2020 it really helped guide me in some directions that I've been discussing with the Lord. And out of God's goodness and grace, probably about 80% of the things that I put on that vision board have come to pass in some shape or form. And so I'm really excited to, to join with you ladies and create this. So sign up by the 21st um, to make sure we have enough supplies and enough snacks and enough socially distanced chairs and everything like that as we come together to write the vision board. Um, evening for the Ladies of City Beautiful, Wednesday, January 27th at 7 p.m. Um, you can sign up online. We'll have a, a link for that as well. And then last week we talked about how we have a great need for more volunteers in Greenhouse. Y'all, our littles are so important and we need your help. We need to be able to come together and get some volunteers and some members for the greenhouse team to help influence the hearts and minds of our kiddos. And so even if you haven't worked with kids before, but there's some little tug in your heart that, that you're like, I would like to, or maybe that's not even the case, but you know we have a need and you'd be willing to step up to help fulfill that need, then get into contact with us, um, reach out to Daniel, um, and contact him and find out how you can get signed up for, like I said, influence in the hearts and minds of our littles here at City Beautiful with the Greenhouse team. It's been great uh, getting a chance to, to share what's going on. We've got a lot going on at the church and we miss all of you and we hope to see you soon. Uh, if I talked a little too fast, just check out uh, citybeautiful.ch slash weekly for all of these announcements and all of the places that you can sign up for the things that are going on. May the peace of the Lord be with you.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to City Beautiful Church. Uh, Today, I'm really excited because it is what we affectionately call Washer Sunday. We like to begin every year um, asking the Lord for a specific word that would guide our journey with Him through this year. Um, And we usually ask for a a word for us as individuals, and then next week we're going to be talking about the vision that the Lord has given for us as a community. Uh, So today what I want to do is kind of hone us in a little bit on a piece of scripture, um, talk about uh, what it means for the Lord to give each of you a word that will guide your conversation with Him this year, and then talk a little bit about how do you steward that word? What are the best practices for you to co-conspire with God to see those things come to fruition in your life? Um, So I'm going to pray And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from 2 Peter, which I like to call Peter 2, Electric Boogaloo. And uh, we'll get right into it. So Heavenly Father, we testify to the truth that you're here and that you're with us, that you are for us, you are not against us. And Lord, even as we are on the cusp of this new year, as we're um, looking to the future with anticipation, sometimes with a little bit of anxiety perhaps, Um, Lord, we need to be reminded of your consistent presence to us, um, that you do work all things uh, for good for those who love you, that you want to partner with us in seeing us step deeper and deeper into your kingdom realities um, so that we can love you better, we can love others better, and we can love ourselves better. So may the word of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be ever pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is going to be from... Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read the entire first chapter, but I'm going to break it up a little bit. So the first piece is going to be um, verses 1 to 11. So this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus the Messiah, to those who have obtained a share of faith equal to our, ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus the Messiah, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. God has bestowed upon us through his divine power everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. The result is that he has given us through these things his precious and wonderful promises. And the purpose of all this is so that you may run away from the corruption of lust that is in the world and may become partakers of the divine nature. So because of this, you should strain every nerve to supplement your faith with virtue and your virtue with knowledge and your knowledge with self-control and your self-control with patience and your patience with piety and your piety with family affection and your family affection with love. If you have these things in plentiful supply, you see, you will not be wasting your time or failing to bear fruit in relation to your knowledge of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. Someone who doesn't have these things, in fact, is so short-sighted as to actually be blind and has forgotten what it means to be cleansed from earlier sins. So, my dear family, you must make the effort all the more to confirm that God has called you and chosen you. If you do this, you will never trip up. That is how you will have richly laid out before you an entrance into the kingdom of God's coming age, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. I love that Peter starts off this kind of second letter um, with this idea of you need to confirm the call that's upon your life. So um, we'll find out later on that Peter is towards the end of his life. These are kind of his parting ideas his parting um, admonitions to the faithful, especially in Jerusalem where he was living, but for the larger church at all. And I think he really has a lot for us to say for us here. And I think what I especially see in this portion of Scripture is, you know, what is the purpose of asking God for vision? Um, I think there's something here that sets us apart from what we often see in the world around us when it comes to New Year's resolutions, for example, like I want to do this for myself or I want to become better at that. You know, when we speak of vision in the Christian household, what we're talking about is uh, what Peter is essentially saying here. The whole point of this is that we may become partakers in the divine nature. And what does that mean? 
He means that God gives us vision that draws us deeper into relationship with Him. And through that deep abiding relationship with God, we come to know who we truly are. But it's interesting here that, that Peter is saying, you know, we need constant reminders of what's true um, or else it's very easy for us to fall away or to forget. And it's so interesting that even in this portion of scripture that he says, you know, some become blind and forget what it means to be cleansed of earlier sins. And I rather think of that, you know, that our faith is not static, you know, even like we talked about last week with the story of the Magi and Herod and the chief priests, that our faith isn't just a one and done, we made this claim, we have this status now and we just move on with our lives, but it's something to be cultivated. And I think of it often as a garden. You know, if you just, if you just plant everything in your garden, then you just leave it and then all of a sudden it dies, you don't say, oh, well, I guess there never really was meant to be a garden here in the first place. It requires your attention and your, your you know, careful processing, like kind of working with the plants, with the soil, with the climate to see it come to fruition. And that's what our faith is like. We can't just make a claim to faith and then do nothing with it or just kind of assume that God's going to take care of the rest because he's calling us to cultivate our faith in the same way that we would a garden. And I think what's so fascinating in this portion of scripture as well, um, that maybe many of us haven't read, maybe we're not that familiar with 2 Peter, is that Peter is encouraging us to steadily throughout life gather together these qualities of person that we call virtue, that kind of help us to maneuver through the uncertainties of life. Um, And that's really, you know, what we've talked a lot about in this community, that we're being formed to look more and more like Jesus, which means day by day, as we're cultivating our faith, it becomes more natural for us to kind of exude the qualities of Jesus's character. Um, And that list that he gives us that we add on virtue, knowledge, which I think he means more of that like intimate knowledge, um, with self-control, with patience, with piety, which kind of just means, you know, um, living a humble and simple life. Um, He talks about family affection, and he means kind of affection for the people of God, not just your biological family, but for the church. We have an affection for one another, and all of that kind of culminates in love. And these are the kind of qualities that you and I see in somebody. We don't question whether or not they're admirable qualities. We just wish there were more people like that in the world. But Peter is making the very bold declaration, these things do not come naturally to us, and they're not things that God just kind of inserts into your hard drive whenever you become a Christian. But it's actually through continually co-conspiring with him to live a life where you're cultivating your faith journey that you see those things built up in yourself and then they eventually become second nature. It comes to you like it does, like breathing does. And so we're going to continue on in this passage with verses 12 to 21 to kind of finish out the chapter and follow along with where Peter is leading us in understanding the connotations of what it means for God to give us that kind of prophetic word as a North Star uh, for our faith journey. So he continues on. So I intend to go on and on reminding you about all this, even though you know it and have been firmly established in the truth which has come to you. But it seems right to me, as long as I am living in this present tent, which he's talking about his body, to stir you up with a reminder, since I know that I shall shortly be putting off this tent as his Lord Jesus the Messiah showed me. So I shall also be making every effort to ensure that once I am gone, you may be able to call these things to mind at any time. When we made known to you the power and appearing of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, you see, we were not following cleverly devised myths. Rather, we were eyewitnesses of his grandeur. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice spoke to him from the wonderful glory, this is my son my beloved one, in whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice spoken from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word made more certain. You will do well to hold on to this, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star shines in your hearts. You must know this first of all, that no scriptural prophecy is a matter of one's own interpretation. No prophecy, you see, ever came by human will Rather, people were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. And so, 
what Peter is essentially doing here is he's, he's confirming to us the core truths of who it is that we claim that we follow in Jesus, the Messiah, the King. But he's also saying, you know, you've got to steward these words that come from the Lord and allow them to guide you in the journey wherever it might take you. And I just think it's so powerful and it speaks to the intimacy that Peter has cultivated over his own lifestyle to say, I know that I'm not long for this world. I want to do well. I want to run the race well, maybe as Paul would have said. But Jesus has already revealed to me that I don't have much longer in this mortal body. And so I want to kind of convey these things to you now. And I think what's so powerful about what he's saying here when it comes to a prophetic word from the Lord, when the God speaks to us, is that every word that God speaks is the unfolding of what he spoke to us in Jesus. That Jesus is the full revelation of what God is really like and what God is doing in the world. And so that becomes a really important test for you and I to understand when God is speaking to us, that it's it's an unfolding or an unveiling or um, you know an extension of what it is that he spoke through Jesus rather than being some sort of parallel thing um, that might actually cause us to be distracted from the real Jesus. Um, and I think I want to encourage you with this as well as we're preparing to kind of come before the Lord and ask him for this word. Um, a lot of times a word from the Lord is the beginning of discovery and not a conclusion. You know, we're so conditioned to this idea that we need to have answers. So whenever God speaks, God speaks answers. And it's clear. Um, but I hope that over the years, many of you have realized, oh, God gives me a word that I don't fully understand. And it's this journey of discovery through the whole year to go, oh, this is what the Lord was talking about. This is how this thing actually came true. And we're surprised and delighted when we follow God into those promises, not entirely understanding them, from the beginning. And indeed, this is what it means to be in a covenantal relationship with God. We don't know all the facts. It's not always clear. But we, over the time, are able to look back and go, oh yes, this is what he was doing the whole time. So I think fundamentally, a word from the Lord keeps us firmly established in the truth of King Jesus. So what does it mean for you and I to hear a word from the Lord. Sometimes that can be really intimidating for a lot of people, depending on your church background. Um, Maybe it was kind of believed that God doesn't really speak anymore. He spoke through the Bible. He spoke to the apostles in the first church, and that's about it. For some of you, maybe God speaks, but he only speaks to the professional Christians, the pastors, the theologians, and all of that. Um, And for others of you, maybe you came from a church where it was very commonly expected that God speaks to everybody, but there were a lot of people who abused that language um, and would kind of use the thus saith the Lord as a weapon against other people or a term of manipulation. And so you were very nervous about that language because it feels again like perhaps what you grew up in. So I wanna kind of give a couple observations that I've made over the years of what I think is helpful when it comes to understanding what we mean when we are believing that God speaks to us and that it's a word from the Lord. Um, First of all, um, we believe that if, when God speaks, that is truth. So if if it's from God, it's true. And I think that you can actually reverse that as well, that if it's true, it's from God. And so the fact that you and I know truth at all means in some way that God has spoken. And we can take confidence in that, you know, that God speaking isn't always the handwriting in the sky or <clears throat> we're taken up into the third heaven and have this crazy vision, but it's, it could be a deep-seated conviction. It could be um, an actual word. It could be an image. Um, but it's something that when we contemplate it, it rings true. Um, because I believe that God is always speaking It's just a question of whether or not you and I are listening. And I think about it almost like an FM radio. Like radio signal is essentially the same signal, but you can tune in to different points to get particular channels. And so I think in a way, God is always speaking love, for this is what we know from Scripture. God is love personified. But whatever you and I hear, these individual words, they're, they're tunings in 
of what love really means. <clears throat> and that may be really difficult sometimes to make the connection. You know, my word for 2020 was apocalypse, and, and that doesn't necessarily sound like a very loving word, but as I've started to connect to see how specific the love of God working in my life and in others is through that word, I can begin to see his character being one of the main things that was revealed by that word carrying me on the journey with him over this past year. Which I think is very important when we're discerning whether or not a word is from the Lord. Is The, the biggest and most obvious question perhaps is, does it sound like him? Does it sound like God in, in terms of his character? And specifically, does it sound like the God that's revealed in Jesus? Are these the sorts of things that Jesus would be saying to you? Um, and I think in that breath and considering when God speaks to you, how does it size up with the other ways that God speaks? How does it size up with Scripture? How does it size up with uh, the great tradition of the church? How does it size up with um, what we understand as the local community, the people that we're intimately connected with? And, and that's a great opportunity to take your word uh, to some people that you're in fellowship with and just say, hey, I feel like the Lord said this. How does that sound to you? Does it connect with what we know of God through nature, uh, through uh, reason? All these different ways that God speaks, we discern the words to say, does it actually sound like the kind of thing he says? And does it match um, the ways in which he's spoken in the past and currently speaks? And then I think the biggest thing too, <coughs> excuse me, does this word move me closer in relationship to him or not? And I think it's the biggest thing that I've discovered when it comes to any kind of life decision we make, if I make this choice, does it bring me closer to Jesus or does it lead me farther away from him? Because God is always drawing us deeper into relationship with him. As, again, as, as Peter is telling us here that we may become partakers in divine nature. So that's kind of like what it means for God to speak and how to discern it. But I think just as an important piece of this is, do you believe that Number one, you are capable of hearing the voice of God. Uh, and number two, that you are worthy of hearing the voice of God. So some of us, maybe we believe that God speaks and we have a strong theology for that, but there's a, a way in which we view ourselves to say, well, I'm just slightly less worthy of that than this person or that person or you know, those folks uh, in that church or whatever it might be. And I think even in that, um, there's an act of faith to believe God when he says that he uh, loves you and has affection for you and that he desires to speak to you. And so it can be really nerve-wracking when we're asking about, you know, finding a word from the Lord to guide us this year um, to even believe that that's something that's possible. But it's part of the act of faith to receive that and to believe that you are who God says that you are. And this is really putting putting that to the test. And I think often that's why perhaps we lower our sights from being able to, to interact with God at that intimate level and we just make it about following the rules or just trying to be a better person. We, we, we lower our expectations of God because we don't ultimately feel like we're the kind of people that this thing happens to. Um, and so I want to encourage you to have a high expectation that God wants to speak to you and has something to say today. I think finally what I would say is this, that there's always hope. God always, God is a God of hope and he always speaks hope. Even if that means passing through darkness, that the word that the Lord might give you, it might be a difficult word. And indeed the journey will most likely be one that is difficult, that faces a lot of darkness, that could be profoundly uncomfortable. Um, but God never condemns us. He always speaks hope that the, even, if, even in the midst of rebuke, <clears throat> that there's always a way forward and a way out. And so if you feel like you're hearing a word of condemnation, I want to encourage you to continue to listen because God may not be done speaking. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> um, you're at home, grab a notebook, take out your phone, something to write with, and we're going to take a good four minutes and we're just going to pray. Now, some of you may already have a word. And so perhaps you just want to ask the Lord to, uh, to speak to you more about that. But many of you, I'm sure, don't have a word yet. So this is going to be a space for you uh, to pray and to ask the Lord to speak to you. And again, maybe it's something that you're surprised by, and maybe it's not. 
Um, but your reaction isn't the thing that determines whether or not it's true. It's who God is and what God's doing in your life that determines if it's true. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to give you a proper four minutes uh, just to sit with the Lord. <clears throat> so Father, I, th- I thank you that you are a God who speaks, and that um, you speak not only uh, to the greats, the mothers and fathers of the church throughout history, but you also speak to us individually um, because you see each of us as worthy of relationship with you. Um, So God, I pray now in this moment that you would open our ears uh, to hear whatever you want to speak as a word uh, that would guide us in 2021 in our relationship with you, but that you would open up our hearts um, in humility to believe that we are capable of hearing you Um, and that you really want to speak to each one of us. So God, I just pray over the next few minutes that you would speak to each of those uh, who are tuning in today. All right, well, I hope that um, the Lord spoke to you, and, and I do hope that in many ways you are surprised. It's, it's just, it's so good to be reminded that um, God wants to speak to us in seasons like this to kind of shore up our faith journey and to help us on down the road. But I think, again, like what Peter is really impressing upon us is it's not just about God speaking, wait till you see all these things come true, and just kind of faith is just sitting there, just kind of twiddling your thumbs, waiting for God to do the thing that he said he's going to do. Um, Sometimes God does speak like that. But I think when it comes to us asking for a prophetic word for the year that guides our individual journeys, we have to recognize that part of it 
is our responsibility to play in seeing those things come to fruition. And I don't think it's always absolutely dependent upon you and I and how well we do. This isn't a performance, like we're not going to be graded on our faithfulness to steward the word. But again, like a garden, it becomes through careful attentiveness and a certain degree of flexibility and ability to improvise our way through life with the leading of the Spirit that helps us to see these things come true. And so, uh, what we've begun to do at the beginning of each year now is to ask the, the Holy Spirit for some divine strategies that would help us to see that word come true. Um, because we need what we call a rule of life uh, to steward vision from God so that we don't get distracted. Now, what I mean by rule of life, you know, rule, again, very scary word, can feel very legalistic. Um, basically, the word rule comes from the same word that we use for trellis. You know, a trellis is kind of like a, usually a wooden structure that's built to help a plant, you know, I think especially of like uh, grapes, like a vine kind of plant. It helps it to grow up and off the ground and to spread out. And it really is there to facilitate the fruitful growth of plants so that the crop they produce is full and hearty. And I think it's a, actually a really great image for what a rule of life means when we're talking about spiritual disciplines. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's this beautiful balance between passion and discipline that sometimes we're just so like awake and in it and we're passionate and that's the thing that guides us through a certain season. Like we can't not be present to the Lord and we can't not pray and <clears throat> we're just so into scripture and all this. And there are a lot of seasons where we don't have passion. Um, but it's really important. I think it's a key marker of maturity kind of in the spirit of last year's uh, yearly vision for us as a church um, to recognize that our faith is not guided by passion because passion will wane and wax. Um, our faith is guided by our commitment. And that requires many seasons where we need to really hone in on discipline to get us through, especially in the dry seasons. Um, <clears throat> and so passion is a gift from the Holy Spirit, uh, but discipline is also a gift. So again, even here, as Peter is saying, like, you know, you're working towards self-control or self-discipline. And it's really important to remember that disciplines and spiritual practices are not, they're not a limit to life. Like they're not things that, oh, I, I used to be able to do whatever I want and that was what freedom is and now I've got to sit down and I've got to do this and <clears throat> there's less time in my schedule because I've put these things on there. And we feel like disciplines squeeze the spontaneity and fullness of life out. But in actuality, if we allow the Lord to lead us, our spiritual disciplines become a guardrail that helps us to actually live a full life. Um, for, and I think it's really that virtue of temperance, that we don't overindulge, we don't overdo it so that we have greater longevity and enjoyment of life. Um, and so when I'm talking about spiritual disciplines, I'm going to give you some examples. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means, <clears throat> but a couple things that I found really helpful in my own process of discerning what spiritual disciplines I need from season to season in my own life. Uh, number one is there's uh, upstream disciplines and downstream disciplines. And this is where I think it's really important that you know your personality. So for those of you who have done some Enneagram work or you've done Myers-Briggs work or whatever that might be, the more you have that language for you and how you think, act, and feel, the more you can understand what kind of disciplines will serve you. So upstream spiritual disciplines are something that does not come naturally to you. And so it's actually, it's like almost like growth through friction because it's so... Uh, contrary to how you would normally operate in the world. So it's really valuable to have disciplines that operate like that, that, you know, that they, they enter you into new ways of being in the world that you normally wouldn't. <clears throat> but there are also downstream spiritual disciplines that are things that maybe do come quite naturally to you. Um, but it just takes a little bit of a shifting into the kingdom for practices that you may already have. So, um, for example, for me, a Sabbath would be a bit more of a downstream spiritual discipline. I just I needed to like define my Sabbath a little bit better, kind of give it a little bit more of a definition of how I'm laying down my work and resting and playing um, for me to enter into it. Whereas I would say um, daily rhythms of prayer are kind of an upstream discipline for me. It's hard for me 
day in, day out to remember to do the same thing. So I've had to use the tools that are available to me to help me to hone in on daily prayer rhythms. Um, there are, so there's upstream and downstream is determined on your personality. And then there are disciplines of engagement, which are basically the disciplines of like, I'm taking up this new thing. I'm adding this new thing into my life. And then disciplines of abstinence, which is saying, I'm laying these things down or I'm clearing out the clutter. And both of those are also really valuable. And I think it can be really good if you have one discipline of engagement and one discipline of abstinence. But, you know, again, that's the kind of thing you're going to have to work out with the Lord. So here's a few, um, I think, kind of key spiritual disciplines that we've talked about in this church and kind of are pretty well representative of these disciplines of uh, engagement and abstinence. So here's a list. Um, and I'll just talk through these really briefly. So Sabbath, um, taking one day devoted to uh, just enjoying God's kingdom, uh, to remind ourselves that we, do, we, we are not defined by our work, uh, to rest, to recharge, to reconnect with God through recreation. Um, I think Sabbath is imperative. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments that we are to take a Sabbath and rest as God rested. Um, And I think it's one of the disciplines that kind of anchors all of the other disciplines in our lives. So if you do not currently practice Sabbath rest, one one 24-hour period out of the week where you do not work and you just rest and play, um, I highly encourage you towards that. The next one is simplicity. Simplicity is really about removing distractions um, that may come between you and God. And so... That might be, uh, you know, getting rid of, I know many of you have gotten rid of some social media accounts in the past or cleared out some of the apps on your phone. Um, But it may also be something about like giving away uh, money that you normally wouldn't. Um, It may also be like fasting. (coughs) Excuse me. (laughs) It's weird to sneeze in the past. (laughs) Um, But fasting may be a, a practice of simplicity where you are, um, taking a day or even just a single single meal and uh, withholding from that and instead using that time for prayer and connection with God. Um, the, the Holy Trinity of spiritual disciplines for me, uh, silence, stillness, and solitude. I've talked about these a lot where you are slowing down just to practice being in God's presence. You're not asking for anything. You're not demanding anything. Uh, you're not even necessarily waiting for him to like speak and give these big reveals. You're just being there. And so, you know, silence is kind of the quiet consent of the mind. Stillness is the quiet consent of the body. And then uh, solitude is the quiet consent of the heart. And so just knowing how to practice those three together is super valuable. Um, Scripture. Incredibly, incredibly important uh, discipline that might be studying scripture, um, doing you know inductive Bible studies. That also may be learning how to pray the scriptures, how to use the scriptures just to be able to connect with God on a heart level. Um, having prayer rhythms, whether that's you know taking up a daily office, uh, having morning and evening prayers. So I pray um, the the morning prayers from the Northumbria community in England, which is a Celtic community in the mornings. And then I have a little reminder pops up on my phone at one o'clock every day to remind me to pray the serenity prayer that many of you would know. So those little prayer rhythms can really help you to ground your conversation with God. Um, Study, Uh, even this would be beyond scripture itself, um, that perhaps there's a certain concept that you want to learn more about. And so, you know, in a couple weeks, for example, we're gonna be launching our new small group studies Um, that are going to be tackling really specific issues within the Christian lifestyle. Um, So devoting yourself to something like that for a season can be invaluable. Um, Service and mission. Getting out there, getting over yourself, and and helping out, furthering the kingdom in really practical ways. Is it uh, partnering with a nonprofit organization in town uh, to go out and to, uh, to really make a difference, to literally make yourself the hands and feet of Jesus. We don't want to just sit in a room and just say that we're Christians. We actually want to show it in our actions. Um, Caring for your physical or your emotional health can also be a spiritual discipline. And so perhaps it's taking care of your body um, so that you 
just are around longer for whatever what God wants to do through you, let's be honest. Perhaps it's taking care of your emotional health and it's, so it's finding yourself a coach or a therapist or a spiritual director, somebody who can really help you to process your own story and to find that kind of holistic healing that all of us so desperately need. Uh, and then finally, uh, a spiritual discipline of community. Um, being with fellow believers on a, on, a, on a deep and intimate level where you're opening up your life to one another, you're encouraging each other, you're challenging each other when necessary, um, but you're not content to kind of skim along the surface of relationship. And so, you know, that might be joining a community group or a small group study here at church. That might be um, finding yourself a mentor, someone who you can meet up with regularly to just kind of process your faith journey. Um, that might be practicing hospitality, committing, you know, once a week or once a month, you're going to invite somebody into your home and you're going to just create a space to show them how valuable they are to you. I think that's an amazing discipline. So there's all different kinds of ways that we can do it. It's easy to get overwhelmed. So I just encourage you maybe just to pick like two disciplines um, for this next season that could really help you to steward the, this word that God is giving you. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you another two minutes. And as you're, as you're kind of looking at this word that God has given you, and you're looking at this list of disciplines, I want you just to kind of pray and ask the Holy Spirit, which two disciplines could I add to my rule of life for the beginning of 2021 that'll help me to steward that word that God has given me? So let's just go ahead and let's just take two minutes. So of course there are some phenomenal resources um, online. We have many books in our church library that speak more in depth about some of these disciplines. So maybe you want to start with prayer a new prayer rhythm, but you don't really know where to go. <clears throat> I am more than happy to, um, to sit with any of you, to FaceTime or Zoom conversation any of you, or to, to, you know, to text on Slack, and to help you figure out what those might look like and to get some resources for taking those next steps in your rule of life. Um, but I wanna encourage you, I think, you know, starting small, like the Lord does not despise small beginnings and saying, I'm just doing these two disciplines for the next season, um, is it really helps it to make it more attainable. Um, and I have come to found, find that you need to practice a spiritual discipline probably for at least four months before you can actually determine whether or not it is fruitful. A lot of times, 
Um, I'll encourage people to a particular discipline and they'll come back to me two weeks later and say, well, it didn't work. Well, let's do the next thing. And, you know, that's, that's the instant gratification of our culture kind of showing through. It's only after there's some real time for the Lord to do His work in and through us that we can begin to see if there's some fruit. So I want to encourage you to stick with it, but just to keep it simple, keep it small. Um, most importantly, I think, use your calendar. Mark it out. Block out the times to be with the Lord to say, this is a non-negotiable. You know, I do this with Sunday mornings and then whenever I have a community group or a small group, I go, this time is for the Lord and for my fellow believers. It's a non-negotiable. I don't make decisions on what I'm doing with those times. And that actually becomes really freeing for how I tend to, to deal with the rest of my time. Um, and then finally, or um, yeah, finally, avoid legalism when it comes to disciplines. So often we go, oh, I have to. And as soon as you say, I have to, I have to read the Bible, I have to pray, I have to go to church. As soon as you do that, you turn it into an obligation and it becomes about checking off a box so that you can kind of get the Holy Spirit off your back. Instead of saying, no, I get to do these things. And remember that when Jesus was encouraging his disciples, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if the spiritual disciplines you're participating in are not easy and light, um, there's either something wrong with the disciplines or there's something wrong with your motivation in those. And so be reflective as you're doing these things to, to really make sure that you are, you are practicing these disciplines with an eye towards growing in your relationship with God. So that's all we have for you today. Uh, I'm really excited to see what words the Lord speaks to you. And I want to remind you again that you can go to citybeautiful.ch slash weekly. And there you'll be able to sign up to come in throughout this week um, in half hour increments. Come into the building and we'll give you a metal washer for you to be able to hammer your word into that. And if you so desire to sit with me and I would love to process with you, help you to figure out those spiritual rhythms and disciplines a little bit more, and of course, pray a blessing over your year. So uh, go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.